Hey everybody, I'm giving you guys time to hop on, share it as you get it. Let me send it out to a few more. time to get on. I apologize that I'm almost an hour late. Um, my beautiful self decided that I was going to try and get some uploads to video to YouTube going and tell me why it was taking an hour to get a video uploaded. I have no idea. So if it doesn't finish uploading, I'm just going to have to redo it. So I'm give people time to get on. Oh gosh. Hi is lies. Hi live in truth. Oh goodness. Hope you guys have been having a good day. Like I said, I'm, I, I apologize that it is so light. Hi, Misty. Hi, everybody. Um, so I know today it's going to be kind of a shorter live than usual. Um, is it? Ignatio. Hi, Ignatio. It's going to be kind of a shorter live than usual just because we're only going over um, two books and they're both small. We're going over the uh, first and second Thessalonians. And as you can see, I have come prepared with everything marked up. <laughs> All right, so um, for everybody who's kind of been following along on the Unraveled series, let me give some people time to comment in and get on. For everybody following the Unraveled series, what are you guys thinking about it so far? Is it helpful, hurtful, confirming some things for you? Uh, just feel free to comment, interact. <laughs> um, if you're uh, hopping on, if you wouldn't mind to share this out to um, people that you know that are following the series as well, it'd be super helpful. Because apparently TikTok likes to shadow ban every other one of my videos. Oh gosh. Anyway. So. The reason um, I went straight to Thessalonians today and um, yesterday and today instead of going straight into revelations like I had originally planned like we talked about um, last week hi Fred thanks for joining uh, like we talked about last week is because this whole past week and weekend I saw more and more people um, you know in con reference and concern to the end times and what it pertains to believers um, actually going to Thessalonians and saying how that confirms everything and I was like Mm, the Bible's not contradictory, so if there's one place that goes against everything else, it's probably that that place is being misunderstood, which is why I decided to go into um, First and Second Thessalonians, and our focus is chapter four, thirteen, through chapter five, through all of Second Thessalonians, to really give that like solid ground, final layer of foundation that every single bit of this is in line with each other. And nothing is contradictory. Um, God works in patterns on purpose, so that way we actually have the ability to seek him. Um, so, when we go to 1 Thessalonians 4, um, 13 through 14, we are seeing that the same word for are asleep and which asleep is the same. It's um, in the Greek, it's... Please forgive me for those who are fluent Greek speakers. It's koimao. Sorry. Koimao. And because it has in itself like four different definitions, you really have to pay attention to the context in which it's being used to know what part of the definition is being discussed. Um, you know, people don't click out. I know. I'm sorry. It's late. Um, if you weren't here for last week, week three should be up on YouTube. That's what I was working on getting uploaded. Um... So, Kuim Ma'au, in reference to, I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning, concerning them which are asleep, is in reference to those who are spiritually dead. And so, all of this is in reference to those who are believers. So, spiritually dead means that you believe in Christ, you decide you were going to give your life to Christ, but you're not walking with the Holy Spirit, you're grieving the Holy Spirit, you're quenching the Holy Spirit, and... 
you're not and in doing so you're not able to walk in spirit and in truth hi sydney thanks for joining hi levy thanks for joining um and that's why it says sorrow not for they have no hope because in john chapter 3 jesus says unless you are born in water and of spirit you will not inherit the kingdom of heaven and that's after you initially believe in him but then when we go to 14 it says if we believe and the word for believe there is pestuo which is from the root word pistis which means you hold a deep conviction for christ's death burial and resurrection and for the truth and trust in him as messiah so belief isn't just saying i believe in you there is a whole depth to the understanding of believing in christ and so where it goes and it says, even so them also which sleep is again koimao, but that in context means those who are spiritually asleep. So you believe in Christ, you are water baptized, you are baptized by the Holy Spirit. Hi, God bless you too. Thank you. Hi, Toro. Thanks for joining. Um, and so you have all of these things, you've done all of these things, but you're more going through the motions. There's no life in your faith and belief um and that's where there's a little there needs to be an understanding in that distinction as well because when you go to at the end of 14 and it says will god bring with him in the greek that's agos and atos which means led to a court of justice that is both those who are spiritually dead and spiritually asleep those who are spiritually dead are the tares those who are spiritually asleep are the chaff and the difference in that is tares have no fruit whatsoever. They are weeds. They are lookalikes. They are pretenders. Thank you, Toro. You're so sweet. You always make my day. Um, and then you have um, the chaff, which are those who are spiritually asleep, just going through the motions. Now, the chaff, the reason the difference in it is in that is it's not producing bad fruit, but it's also not producing good fruit. It's like produ producing little bitty seeds, which helps it slump a little bit. But there's still a difference between that and the wheat, which is bearing all of the fruit, which is bowed over. So those will be taken out first. It's the same as the wheat and the tares harvest. And they're led to a court of justice. That being said, this is where they are going to be split. And when you hear people talking about in Christ's second coming, or not when Christ's second coming, I'm sorry, when Christ comes to rapture the church, those who are the true righteous alive in Christ believers who have remained and have endured, the ones who were spiritually asleep got to fully learn and make all of their faith alive with Christ because they believed in him. They were water baptized. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. They were just going through the motions. They didn't know how to ignite the flame of the Holy Spirit to ignite that flame of their belief. But those who were the tares, those who are spiritually dead, there's a cutoff. And so we get to 16. And it says, 16 says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. This is Revelation chapter 14, verses 12 through 20. But you can also stack Revelation chapter 7 on top of that section because it is the same. It's just different descriptors of the event that's taking place. So... You have the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and this is all the seventh trumpet, that's the tares, those who are dead. This is not saying those who have passed away and are buried six feet under, they're not asleep, they're not taking a nap. Scripture is very, very clear. It is upon man once to die and then immediately face judgment. And in that moment, it's one place or the other it even says paul is even um talking with peter when peter's grieving about um i guess the loss of his mother-in-law please correct me on that i'm pretty certain that's what it is but paul's saying to be do not be sorrowful because to be absent from the body is to be present with the lord okay so the word for dead in christ is spiritually dead there's no fruit there's nothing there it's just a whole big bunch of pretending and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up the word is harpezo which means a snatching away a sneak a seizing together and with them and the with them that we meet the lord in the air is those who are spiritually asleep and needed that holy spirit fire ignited in them in the air 
there's a difference there. They become part of the sanctified. There's this last part right here, which are those with the righteous who are fully alive in Christ, which is what I like to refer to as the sweet spot, which is going to be in my book in the fall, The Believer's Birthright. The current release date right now, I'm, I'm hoping to have it released on the Feast of Trumpets or right around that time. Um, but it says, so shall we, those who are alive, ever be with the Lord. Now what's happening here is what's described in Revelation 19 as the marriage supper of the Lamb. Only those who are alive in Christ, so you believe in Christ fully, you hold that deep conviction, you were water baptized, death, burial, and resurrection with him, you were filled with the Holy Spirit, you are walking by the Holy Spirit, you are moving fully in the commands and the obedience and the righteousness that God has set out for us. Those are the bride of Christ, the people who are living in the sweet spot. There is a difference between saved, sanctified, and the sweet spot. And that does get into detail in 2 Thessalonians. But we're, we're starting here just because it, it's like a whole big lump sum of information. So wherefore, comfort each other with these words. And then we get into chapter 5. It says, But these times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. Why? Because Paul has already spoken to them on multiple occasions. Remember, Peter has already gone to Thessalonica. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, who are they? The unbelievers, the lawless, the dead in Christ, all of that. Peace and safety. Where are you from? I'm from Trinidad and Tobago. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for joining. I'm from the United States, um, from the South. So if you hear a little bit of a twang in my voice, that's that's where I'm from. That is absolutely, I'm a little bit stunned that my videos are making it all the way to the way to Trinidad. Thank you so much for joining that. Wow, praise God. Whew, that's something I never expected. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Ruthie. Thanks for joining. Um, so it says peace and safety. So what are we hearing right now all over the news? This is a part of the birthing pains, but it will continue into tribulation. You're hearing everybody talk about peace and safety, peace and safety, love your neighbor, twisting the word to make everybody feel guilty and shameful. And we all know that if somebody's being led by the Holy Spirit, they're not going to make you feel guilty and shameful, which means it's not the Holy Spirit that is leading this call. And then then, immediately after they got a majority to comply with peace and safety, sudden destruction comes upon them. The word for destruction is perdition. So, we, so as it will travail upon women with child, that they shall not escape. This is Matthew chapter 24, when Jesus is discussing woe to those who are pregnant and nursing and have small children during this time. Well, why? Because there's going to be economic discourse. There's going to be mass persecution. There is going to be famine. And I don't know about any of you guys, but there's not a single good parent alive. I'm sure there are some abusive ones out there, but as far as like good parents, the majority of parents, there's not a parent alive that I know that would not do absolutely everything in their power to make sure their children are taken care of and supplied with all of their needs. That's why Christ is giving this warning, not because it's bad to have children, but because that's going to be something that is preyed upon by those who are pushing this antichrist, uh, governmental, one world policies all over the place. Hi, Maisie Grace. Thanks for joining is because they're going to pull on the heart heartstrings to try and deceive parents, but for the safety of your kids. Okay, so you have to be mindful of all of that. And this is where it comes with having the strength and patient endurance with the Holy Spirit, because you have to know that it is better for, and I'm really trying to say this without sounding callous, it will be better for you to pass away and be with the Lord than to subject your children to lies and atrocities just because you are in a place of fear. Now having dinner and listening to you. Aww. What time is it in Trinidad? I don't even know the time difference. I had somebody also reach out to me from Bulgaria and someone reached out to me from Germany and I am blessed and astounded and shocked and just 
I never expected to have more than maybe a couple hundred on this account and the fact that there's nearly 15,000 of you is a blessing and nerve-wracking because that is that is a lot of a lot of souls that I am responsible for and I'm grateful <laughs> I'm grateful that uh, the father trusts me but also it does that's a heavy weight <laughs> um but yeah, we have to be very, very mindful that it's going to be better that we be with the Lord than it is to it's 9 46 p.m. over here. Oh, wow. Um, very mindful that it's, it's going to be better to be with the Lord to, to subject our families and our children to the atrocities of the world war government. You know, even our country's forefathers had said it best. Um, for those who would sacrifice a little bit of freedom for peace and safety deserve neither. They knew then. It's that's not something that's worth it. So it says. So we get to verse four, and it says, "Ye are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief." What that means is, if you were living in the light and you were living in Christ, His return and the rapture and all of these things taking place, it's not going to surprise you. Yeah, I have one, two, three, four, five, six. I have eight. I'm actually working on my um, appointment with, wait, no, one, two, three, four. But no, I have eight. Okay, yeah, I'm actually working on my appointment for um, my ninth one right now. It's uh, based on both of my kids and Isaiah 49 too. Um, but yeah, if we are walking in the light, which verse five says we're children of the light, not of the day, we don't live in darkness, then Christ's return and coming back for the church, the bridegroom coming back for the wise brides, is not going to be a surprise to us. It's not going to it's not going to show up and just rob us of people. We are going to be aware. We are going to be the good watchman, the good servant who knows that the work must be done. Verse 6, therefore let us not sleep. Don't be spiritually asleep. Don't just go through the motions. Remain on fire. Leviticus 6:13 says, "Do not ever let the fire on the altar go out." The altar in us, as 1 Corinthians 6, 19, the temple of the Holy Spirit, temple of God. Our heart is the altar, our heart posture, where our focus is at. Out of, out of the heart, the mouth speaks, your actions come from. Yes, absolutely, Jesus is Lord, Lord of all. Uh, one of my pastors used to say, if Jesus isn't Lord of all, he's not your Lord at all. Um... So we have to be sober mind minded. We have to keep that fire burning on the altars of our hearts. Hi, Brandon. Thanks for joining. Um, and so then we get to verse seven. So they that are asleep. So these are those who are spiritually dead, not just those who are going through the motions, those who are asleep, sleep in the night. This is where they're being surprised by the thief in the night that they are drunk and they are drunk in the night. They are Matthew 24, 48 through 51 drinking with the drunkards and revelation 14 verse 8 drinking the wine of the wrath of babylon this is the evil servant the bad watchman and it all goes back to ezekiel 33 the difference between a good watchman and a bad watchman are you putting the warning out there we can lead a horse to water but we can't they we can't make them drink but they don't know that they can drink if the water's not been shown them okay you are the salt and the light of the earth if there's not at least one person a day that you're even just proclaiming that Jesus is Lord to and looking for those opportunities to share the gospel, you are not being a good servant. You are not being the watch, the good watchman. And you have to be, be mindful of those things. And we all miss it. None of us are perfect. You know, there's a lot of things that hop in the way and I'm, and I'm not blind to that. Um, <laughs> good evening, Lando. Uh, I'm not blind to that. There's times I've missed it. But when you miss it and you're aware that you potentially missed it, repent. It's like, I'm sorry, Lord. I missed it today. Help open my eyes so that the next time I don't. You know, the blood remains on your hands when there's a lack of repentance. When there's a lack of clear understanding and accountability. That there was a door open for you to share the gospel. To be the good watchman. To be the good servant. And you, and you didn't do it. And that's what brings us down to verse 8. It says, let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love. And this is where it takes a little bit of digging because it says the breastplate of faith and love. 
but we're told that the breastplate is righteousness. So now we are given the clue. We're given the formula for what makes a person righteous, and that is faith and love. If you love me, keep my commands, John 14, 15, to love the way God has shown us how to love not only him, but love others. And faith is that action word. It is putting your force and weight of your belief behind something. It's my, one of my new favorite words right now, which is logi zomai. It is the reality of faith of the amount of force and weight that you have behind your belief. It is logi zomai that made Abraham righteous unto God, even though Christ had not been the sacrifice yet. It is an obedience and a trust that is faith and love. That is what makes righteousness. And then for a helmet, the hope of our salvation that covers our head, gives us that mind of Christ. Yes, Hebrews eleven six. six, you're absolutely right, Hazel Lies. It is impossible to please God without faith. And he who seeks him must know that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Which is Matthew six thirty three. seek ye first the kingdom of God. The Bible will consistently line up with itself. Verse 9, God hath not appointed us unto wrath. I love this right here. Because you're going to hear so many people who are preaching a pre-trib doctrine. And they say, well, God hasn't appointed us under wrath. You're not wrong. He hasn't. Tribulation and wrath are two different things. Are two different scenarios. Two different situations. Tribulation, trials, they create a fire a purification to help transform you into that new creation that you are in Christ. However, without that growing period, without that trial, without that tribulation, without that knowing that you have to put all of your focus and faith and force on the Father, that's right, Hazel Eyes, refiner's fire, then there's no transformation. Then you're not a new, you're not a new creation in Christ. You're just somebody going through the motions. Wrath is is appointed unto those who ultimately reject and blaspheme God, who call themselves believers, but are the synagogue of Satan. That's what that verse means. So it's not appointed us unto him to have wrath because we have not earned his wrath. We have not become that complacent, spiritually dead individual who just rejects and blasphemes but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. So wrath is separate from tribulation. We should, is potential, we should live together with him. That should comes from, are we edifying one another? Are we being good watchmen to one another? Are we walking in the footsteps of the master who is Christ, our sacrifice, our salvation, our redemption, should is a very important word. Should is not a guarantee. It is a potential, which means it is a continual walking out of your faith. Patient endurance. Endurance is not for short distances. Endurance is for long distances. Amazing grace. Those who are obedient are not subject to his wrath. Amen. Absolutely. So then this is where we get to the ad admonitions for holy living. This is, this is for those who are alive in Christ. And chapter 5, verse 12 of 1 Thessalonians. We beseech you, that means we beg you. Know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. Admonish means to encourage or lift you up or teach you, accept you. Um... So it is important for you to note who is actually doing work for the Lord and work in the kingdom because it is important to give honor where honor is due. You know, this is why I have issues so much about people who are just like blatantly going after and calling people out by name and calling them all false teachers and false prophets and we can't trust anybody is because... Yeah, somebody can be false, but we also know as believers that God works every single thing out for the good of those that love him. Which means you don't know that God's still not utilizing that ministry to work some good out for some people. 
And when you're putting that information out there and you're doing it in a way to cause damage and division and discourse, then you're actually placing a stumbling block in front of other believers who would have received something good out of that. But now you have placed a fire of resentment in them for the person who they had trust in before. And they didn't have trust in because they believed this person was ultimately holy, but they had trust in because they knew that God was going to work things out for the good of them who loved him and who were seeking them. Because even a blind squirrel finds a nut twice a day. Sorry, I just mixed two analogies. Even a broken clock is right twice a day, which means just because someone is false doesn't mean that they're not actually going to share some truth. Um, and if you are like Pastor Michael Todd, who was sitting in a conference being led by Joel Olstein and posted about it on his Facebook. And multiple people took to YouTube to make entire hour long series about why Michael Todd should no longer be trusted as a pastor because he gave credit to Joel Olstein, who we know is a false prophet and snake oil and all these things. Just really throwing stones for absolutely no reason other than self-righteousness. Because Michael Todd was talking about a revelation that he received from the Holy Spirit while he was in that conference. He was giving honor where honor was due because had it not been that he was in that conference hearing what was being preached, he would not have had that revelation. Good night, Brandon. Thanks for joining um, my next week, the whole live will be up on my YouTube channel. So make sure that you go like and subscribe. And so that's the importance of giving honor where honor is due. That's the importance of just being aware of who the false, the false teachers and false prophets are because it's to keep you away from them. But when you're busy pointing it out, being self-righteous, thinking it's your Christian due diligence to call everybody out by name, Pharisee, then you were putting stumbling blocks in front of your other brothers and sisters who up until the moment you made those statements were receiving bread of life because the Holy Spirit was still working. Be mindful. Be mindful about who you attack because your thoughts are not God's thoughts. You are not helping him do his job and you're actually making it harder. And now he has to go deal with you before he can finish helping those he was trying to build up and edify through the Holy Spirit. You, everything that you send out gets sent back out to you. It's called reaping what you sow. Christ talks about this a lot. And that's why we get to verse 14. And Paul is saying, warn them. Warn them who are asleep, who are unruly, lawless, who are feeble-minded, or lacking understanding with the Holy Spirit, who are weak spiritually and physically. You're going to have elderly. You're going to have younger children. And be patient toward everyone. That means believers and non-believers alike in every step of their walk. Which is why we need to be careful of our words. Yes, absolutely. Matthew 12, 37. You will give an account of every single word that you have ever spoken in your life. Proverbs 18, 21. Is it of life or is it of death? You will give an account. There's no way around that. So see not that you render evil for evil. But rejoice with everyone. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, gifts of the Spirit, talk, talking about the body of Christ. Rejoice with others. Mourn with others. That's how you love people. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care about who they are. So they know how much you care about them. You know how people came to believe in Christ and who he was? It wasn't because he was partying with the Pharisees. It's because he was sitting with the sinners. He was sitting with the broken. You can tell more about the character of somebody and the believer by how they handle the broken hearts of others than you ever can about how well they lead with a loud voice. If we cause someone to stumble, their blood is on our hands. Absolutely. Absolutely. If we cause someone to stumble, we don't repent. Their blood is on our hands. 100%. Y'all out here thinking God is kumbaya and 
kumbaya, my lord, sitting around a campfire. You don't know God's character well enough. He gives these warnings on purpose. Nobody out here teaching, who is truly called and anointed by the Father, nobody out here teaching is doing it because it's glamorous. 90% of those who are called and anointed ran. I ran. Spent nearly 15 years running. I didn't want a part of it. Mm -mm. Not because I didn't love the Father. That weight is heavy. It is not one to wield lightly. But here's the rub. Here's the kicker. Even those who are in the pulpit on social media leading all these other people and they weren't called and anointed by God, that they put themselves in that place of leadership. That's on my tongue. Sorry. They put themselves in that place of leadership. That warning still applies to them. It becomes harsher on them because they're trying to sustain what God didn't didn't create for them. So they're having to sustain it by themselves, which is why you have everybody tickling the ears of everyone else because they're worried about their paychecks from the tithe checks. And nobody is actually preaching truth anymore because 90%, no, nah, I'm not going to go that far. I'll say about 85. 85% of people who are leading the church today called themselves to the pulpit. You will find a harder time finding somebody who was actually called and ordained and anointed to be in that position, who was leading people on a massive scale because the weight is so heavy. How do you know that you are called to be preached by God? It'll be revealed to you by the Holy Spirit. It'll be revealed to you by a mentor and you will be it's really where you will be basically somebody that people naturally flock to for help and advice to comfort them, to care for them. It was really weird for me because a lot of people growing up didn't know my story. And yet I was hearing from people from all walks of life for help and advice. And I'm like, I'm a sheltered kid from the South. What is happening? Uh, it's what my mom used to, my mom, my mom used to like to call it being a drama magnet. Like you're not looking for drama, it just shows up. She would say that Yeshua, that Jesus was a drama magnet. Like he wasn't looking for trouble, it just showed up at his door. Why? Because he carried an anointing to fix problems. He carried an anointing for spiritual, emotional, mental healing. He carried an anointing of compassion for others and caring for others and leading them well. I hope your evening is blessed by the Lord. Thank you, Tristan. I hope yours is too. Hi, Mary. It's okay. I was, I was late. I was late too. It's fine. <laughs> so you're going to carry all of these separate signs that are going to show that you are somebody who was called to be in a place of leadership. But there will be confirmations because God is a God of order and there's going to be confirmations. He's not just going to throw you to the wolves. His word says out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every single word be established. That's why you're also going to find verses in the Bible that said at least three times out of the mouth, two or three witnesses. So if you are somebody who has been told by a mentor, been shown by the Holy Spirit, is that person that people naturally just flock to even though you're not looking for it? It's a good chance that you're carrying an anointing to lead God's people. And if you're that person, get on your face before the Lord. Get on your face before the Lord and find out. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you're leading God's people by being in the pulpit. You can lead God's people at your work. You can lead God's people by your social media posts. You can lead God's people talking to others on the street. So don't stress so much about if you're going to be this, in this position where people are going to be seeing you. If you're not chosen by God to preach and teach... I am going to very compassionately, heavily warn against putting yourself in that position. Sometimes it's your testimony that calls you to. Yeah. You'll also find, um, you'll find that a lot of people who are anointed to preach or teach, lead in any kind of capacity, whether it be an apostle, prophet, um, teacher in that fivefold ministry setting, 
most of those people have ridiculous testimonies. Like I'm talking, it is all over the map. I have a post that I placed on my Instagram. It goes a little bit into it, but my testimony is all over the place. Drugs, alcohol, sexual trauma, um, gangs, uh, <laughs> getting arrested, underage, whatever, rape, survivor, oh gosh, massive car wrecks, almost died, all of these different things. I was all over the map of, with somebody with a testimony, which is hilarious because when I think back as a kid, like my testimony up until that point was Jesus saved me from lying to my parents. And I used to be that one person that would sit in the, sit in the back and go, man, this testimony is awesome. And then my testimony became awesome and I realized it was not that awesome. Um, but the reason their testimonies are all over the place is because you're going to lead people from every walk of life. And to lead people well, you have to survive just about every walk of life. And so don't look on, and that, even if that's not your testimony, even if your testimony is God saved me from a lying tongue, fantastic, fantastic. That means that you're being made into somebody who was trustworthy and compassionate. That is amazing. Um, absolutely, we are called to make disciples of all nations. The difference with preaching is you were literally shepherding people and you're mentoring people and you are raising them up. And the goal is to raise them up exactly like Christ. And if there is anything in your theology that does not line up with the theology of heaven, you are raising them up to be led astray and then to lead others astray. The weight of the warning is heavy. Anyone you cause to lead astray and you remain unrepentant for and you do not take accountability, their blood is on your hands, which means you can be a full-fledged saved pastor and you have led one person to hell. You're going right there with them if you remain unrepentant. Their blood is on your hands. It is a heavy warning and it is not one to take lightly. That is why I ran for nearly 15 years. And that was after being trained and mentored and called and driving all over the country, learning from people. I was still running. You will be judged more strictly. Absolutely right, soldier for God. I mean, it's standards. Amazing Grace is right. Holding the office of a prophet, preacher, pastor, teacher, any of those things, there is a higher standard. That's why Jesus says, woe to you who stumble, but woe to you who make them stumble. It would be better to have a millstone tied around your neck and tossed into the sea than to cause one of the children, which is children of God, to stumble. Let that sink in. Just let it sink in. If you or you know if you are or you know somebody that called yourself to the pulpit, get on your face before the Lord. Because he may utilize that now in a plan and bring you to this place of repentance. But it is better to walk in the will of God, the perfect will of God for your life, than it is to walk in the permissive will of God for your life. In this instant, in this instance, asking for forgiveness is not better than asking for permission. So we're to make sure that we're not rendering, I'm sorry, I, I, I get off on tangents, guys, but I appreciate the comments and the questions. You know, I'm gonna I'm let the Holy Spirit lead like I do every week. So I'm probably gonna end up all over the place. And that's just okay with me. Um, but chapter five, Verse 16, so we rejoice evermore. 17, we pray without ceasing. And in everything we do, and everything we gain, and everything we are, give thanks to the Lord. And then this right here. This is the will of God in Christ for every single believer. 
quench not, grieve not the Holy Spirit. Why? Leviticus 6.13, the fire on the altar of your heart must continue burning. 20, despise not prophesying. That means when you see or hear people prophesying, it is not your job, not your job to sit there. And I'm not talking about just for myself. I have seen this on multiple occasions before the Holy Spirit had me do that last week. I want that made very clear. I am not bearing witness on myself. I have seen this happen for multiple years and this is scripture that needs to be called out. I am in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Brandon. As a person who is ex-LGBTQ, I love the people who are in the LGBTQ wholeheartedly. But I do not support the lifestyle. I will love you. I will have dinner with you. I will be friends with you. I will help raise your kids with you. But I'm not going to support the lifestyle because I love you too much. It would be wrong of me to encourage you or anyone else. And this is coming from a person who was saved from that. It would be wrong of me to encourage it or encourage anyone else knowing that that is sending you to a one-way ticket of eternal separation from the Father. That That's cruel. That's not love. Will I make you change? No, that's not my job. Will I tell you that you were going to burn in hell forever? No, that's cruel. That's not my job. My job is to love you, to encourage you, to want you to live a long and healthy life. Because I was that person who dealt with that and was told by other believers that you're going to go to hell. These were spirit filled believers. These were people who knew that I was traumatized, that my mind had been perverted about what sex anything was. It's cruel. So I support the people, but I don't support the action, and I'm not going to beat around the bush on that. But I love you. I will fight a grown person for you. I'll probably help you hide a body and repent about it later. But I'm not going to encourage you to end up into a place of eternal, eternal separation because I was somebody who was headed there too. And then I was somebody who was shown hell and shown my place in hell. It's not fun. It's not nice. <laughs> it's not a party. And it's not something I wish on anyone. And I'm not going to lead anybody there. So I love you. I support you. I want you to have a long and happy life. But I, I, I just, I won't encourage. I won't encourage the sin. But it's not my job to change you. I'm not God. I'm not the Holy Spirit. I'm not Jesus. It's my job to love you. Mike the Atheist, you can say hell's not real. That's your stance as a person who has seen it, as a person who has been in it, as a person who holds a scar on my physical body from being there. And I'm really sad that the light's not showing it right. Holds a scar on my physical body from being there. I absolutely will tell you that hell is real and it burns hot. I'm, I'm not going to beat around the bush. It does you no favors. It does me no favors. Again, a whole lot of lame. Welcome. Join the page. If, if that's how you feel, go for it. Make your own choices. You're a grown person. I'm very serious, Mike. Very serious. I appreciate that, Kibbs. Thank you. Let me see if I can change the lighting so that you can see. Go ahead and, uh, Randy, go ahead and unmute Mike just because there's some response here. And I'm just trying to make sure I can get you to see this scar right here. Make sure. Right. It's fading now because it's been about eight months. Everybody see it? 
Not lying. And if you can't see it, I apologize. I'm doing my best to show it to you. How did I make it to adulthood without supervision? Had a lot of supervision, actually. I was in a very strict household. What's my scar from? Being sent to hell. Was. You know what my punishment was? You want to know? For my punishment... Because at this point, I had repented of the LGBTQ. My punishment was leading people astray unwittingly because I was trusting what my mentors were telling me instead of double checking and fact checking and listening to the Holy Spirit. So there was people that I was actually leading astray and people who had died after I had spoken to them and led them astray. I was literally being carved with the words that I spoke to them in falsehood. You can call it a joke all day long. You are free to absolutely believe whatever you want to believe. I cannot change anything about that. I'm not going to pretend to. I have my evidence. I have my convictions. What you believe is between you and whatever creator you believe in. But what I believe and what I have faith in and what I am standing behind is the word of God Almighty, Yohe Vavhe, the creator of the universe, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, your sacrifice and Messiah on the cross, and the Holy Spirit, your comforter and your guider. Hi from Israel. Thank you. Hi. Thank you for, for joining. So I'm not, I'm not going to sugarcoat anything. I'm not going to pretend like it's all hunky-dory and maybe it's metaphorical. Maybe it's allegorical. Maybe we don't know. If you are in that position, you need to get on your face before the Lord. Humble yourselves and seek after him. No, 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 no. Not you. I was, I was still speaking. I was still speaking to Mike Proudboy. Yes, I had to repent of the LGBTQ lifestyle. It, it is a sin. It, it is what it is. There's so many things that are sins too. It's not the only sin, people. Lying is a sin. Jealousy at the point that you want to harm your, your brother or sister, your neighbor, is a sin. Slander is a sin. What does that mean though? That means that I had to ask forgiveness and I had to renounce living in that lifestyle. And I had to allow, allow my heart to be changed. It, it doesn't happen overnight. And contrary to popular belief, that does not mean you pray the gay away. That means you put yourself in a place of humility and allow a transition and a transformation to take place organically. Now, I am not saying that if you find a woman, another woman or another man attractive, that's a sin. No, lusting after them with your eyes is the sin committing the act is the sin i'm very confident in my sexuality and in my marriage and being a mother to my two children and i will still sit here and say that that woman is attractive i'm not lusting after them at this point it becomes a thing of edification so please don't allow people to get that twisted either just because you think someone is attractive does not mean that you are attracted to them there is a difference Jesus does speak of the Trinity, but he does not use the word Trinity. Trinity is an English word that we have put on it, but he does speak of himself, of the Father, and of the Holy Spirit, all as three distinct persons. So don't get lost in the wording of the Trinity. Understand that he does speak on all three. Yes, the act of doing it is a sin, because sin is an action in transgressing the law just because you're dealing with attraction is not the sin that's a struggle i'm sure a lot of people a lot of men and women alike deal with and they're not just willing to they're not willing to talk about it it is the action that becomes the sin it is the same with drunkenness it is the same with getting high it is the action not that is getting that is the sin not the struggling with the desire that you have to 
die to your flesh for. Gayness is no normal occurrence in nature. Don't call it a sin. Carl, I'm going to let you in on something that the church also doesn't talk about. See, when the fall of man happened, the original sin happened. Sin entered not just people, entered the whole world. Do you realize that all animals in nature and things that we're looking at didn't ever attack people, lived in harmony with everybody, and lived the way that they were designed to, male and female, to procreate? When sin entered the world, animals didn't get a choice because animals don't have a spirit the same way. They have emotions, they have a mind, they have a will, but they don't have a spirit. So there was no control when sin entered the world and it entered them too. So what you are saying is you as a thinking, feeling, conversation having individual, you have less control over your actions and your thoughts and your desires than a house cat. And I'm confidently making this argument because I said the same things. If you truly believe you have less control and responsibility and accountability over yourself than a house cat, that's between you and your creator. Not me. <sighs> because the church doesn't teach the trueness of being made in the image of God. So, shameless, a little bit of a shameless plug. Go to my bio. Get my book, Heaven's Blueprints. You want to learn what the true image of God is and the design and the creation and why a lot of these arguments we're still having would already be put to bed? Get the book. Read it. See, because I'm just going to make this statement here because I don't want to give anything away, but I'm just going to make this statement here. If the Bible says man and man or woman and woman cannot reproduce, cannot create, cannot be fruitful and multiply. Yet the Bible also says we're made in the image of the triune God. Genesis 127. Let us make mankind in our image. That is everything on the earth is made in the image, even down to our, our molecular structures. And in Luke, we read that God, Yahweh, and the Holy Spirit within Mary, not the spirit of Mary, but the Holy Spirit within Mary, conceived Jesus in the flesh. But God's already said man and man can't create. And Jesus had to be born sinless, which means he couldn't have any human DNA. It's still an argument because the church refuses to let go of, excuse my French, to let go of the balls they put on men that it wasn't supposed to be just men. It's still an argument because the church is intentionally, willingly, out of pride and arrogance, leaving room for it to still be an argument. Because if man and man created then it wouldn't be a sin or an abomination for man and man to be in a position to create. Because God doesn't go against his word. He submitted himself to it, actually. So it's a useless conversation. It's a moot point. And a lot of people can say, oh, that's just how it is. We, we could never know. We can't go against God. Eh, True. But then you're not also following the biggest command that Jesus gave, which was seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You are right. You are right, the philosopherian. So if y'all want the truth, full context of everything I just said, this is not a plug on me. This is simply for your information. Go get my book, Heaven's Blueprints. By the way, that book, the Holy Spirit, wrote through me over the course of seven years. Started in spring 2014. It 
just finished spring of this year. Because homosexuality is a manipulation and a perversion. It it is all right. Anything that is not God is of Satan by default, whether you want to open your eyes to that or not. And Satan's goal, the enemy's goal, hell's goal, you see all throughout scripture, is to pervert and manipulate the things of God to exert their own power over God, the same reason they got kicked out of heaven. So if that being the case, how do you exert power over God? You destroy his creation. How do you destroy his creation? You cut off entire bloodlines and entire generations. How? By manipulating and perverting the mind. And you don't have to stop being gay to give your life to Christ. It's not a overnight. Now, some people have talked about stuff happening overnight. It is a process. It is a transition. It takes time. You didn't, you didn't become this way overnight, and you're not going to change overnight. You're not going to become a new creation overnight. It took you 20-something years to become the person you are right now. It might take 20-something years to become something new. It's the act, it's the fact of if you are going to begin to walk out this process because you feel a pull that there's something greater out there, and Jesus is your Savior. Stop listening to people who say you can't be gay and a Christian. There are so many Christians that struggle with so many different other sins. Because they're still walking out their process. Walk out your process. Yes, disciple, I'm reading your comments. That's where this little rant came came about. So walk out your process. What does the Bible say about evolution? It talks about creation. And by the way, evolution, Darwin debunked himself. We're still teaching it as real science, but Darwin himself said, and I quote, in his book, The Theory of Evolution, if it was actually true, it would still be happening. He actually proved creation while trying to prove evolution. But we're still teaching evolution as a science. You want to know how that's true? My physical science teacher told me that was true while she kicked me out of class for disrupting. Evolution occurs on a vertical scale. And what I mean by that is evolution is better designed and populous as a place of growth. So we can evolve, we can grow, we can adapt, but we cannot change our genetic structures. Altering genetic structure is not of God. So horizontal evolution, the theory that everything came from a speck and grew into a bunch of different, you know, genus and phyla, that's false. Horizontal evolution, false, holy. Vertical, growth, transformation, adaptation, natural selection, that's true. Bible even says, if any man be ignorant, let him remain ignorant. Translation, you can't fix stupid. Natural selection. What if we could change shape? You can change shape based on weight and size and if you're going to lift muscles or eat 57 Big Macs. But if you are altering to grow taller, taking HGH, hormones, all of these other things, that's not natural. It didn't happen on its own. User of the crown, God is one in the same way that a husband and wife is one. One unit. Three persons three individual jobs operating in one unit with God the Father, the spiritual head. A family structure. Individual persons, individual purpose, individual jobs 
operating as one unit with the husband as the spiritual head. In the image, on purpose. He literally made it easy like giant Lego blocks to be able to seek out his mysteries. Yet we are so dumbfounded by all these other trivial questions and pursuits that we miss it. It's simple. We make it complicated. They don't argue because they are perfection. They are moving in one unit. Could they divorce? Probably, but being that the Godhead, God the Father, submitted himself to his word. And the only thing that allows for divorce truly is the hardness of your heart. Because in the hardness of your heart, there is no forgiveness, there is no change, there is no love. Which means you can't operate it in one unit. So if any of the Godhead would have a hardness of heart situation, heaven would cease to exist. Why didn't God save MLK to free his people like he did Moses? Moses still died. Moses was actually still punished for being disobedient. And when the MLK situation comes down to it, I really don't want to get into conspiracy theories, so I'm going to say this. It is easier to motivate it is easier to motivate a people to action, to find responsibility and strength in somebody who's a martyr than it is in somebody who's telling them what to do every single step of the way and they lose their own ability to make their own decisions. The black community found strength and power and backbone when Martin Luther King was martyred and I will absolutely stand firm that Martin Luther King was a martyr. And the black community found their power, found their strength, found their will to stand up. Jesus, while our sacrifice, while that was part of the plan, was also a martyr. And those who followed him, who were ridiculed and also martyred, found their strength to stand up and said, if he's willing to die for it, so am I. Good Lord, don't look so abnormal. You're going to preach the audience. Christians need God by now. What? I'm emotional. I'm animated. I make points. If you want a robot, I'm pretty sure Siri is available. He did finish his purpose. He was also a martyr. I'd argue that Peter finished his purpose. He was also a martyr. Same with the rest of the disciples and apostles. They finished their purpose. They were also martyrs. What are my thoughts in Revelation? We're getting into that next week. Enjoy the tangents. <laughs> the end of chapter five. The will of God concerning every single believer. Quench not the spirit. Grieve not the spirit. Don't despise those who prophesy, which means if you don't agree with it, keep your mouth closed. Prove all things. First John chapter four. All of it. Test every single spirit. Why? Because the spirit of the Antichrist is already in the earth. The spirit of the Antichrist has infiltrated the church. I'm going to leave that there. And abstain from all appearances of evil. The very God of peace, God of peace is the Holy Spirit, sanctifies you wholly to be preserved blameless. How do you be preserved blameless? You are sealed by the Holy Spirit, by the f being filled of the Holy Spirit, keeping the fire of the Holy Spirit burning on your heart, and walking and talking as Yeshua walked and talked, loving not your life unto death. Why is that important? Romans chapter 3, verses 22 to 30. Because those who are following after Christ in the exact same faith that Christ had 
God will not be able to tell a difference between you and him on judgment day. Likewise, you will be set apart. And people of this world will know that you truly follow Jesus by your actions and your conversation and the way you walk. And yeah, guess what? Sometimes you're going to flip some tables. But you're also going to sit with sinners. And you're also going to make the hypocrites mad. John the Nightmare. Uh, Brandy, if, is John the Nightmare you're muted at? I didn't say any of his conversations. So, faithful is he, God, that calls you because he will do it. If God calls you to it, he will sustain it. Why? Because he funds his ideas. If you do it yourself, you have to sustain it. That's why it's important to know what God's will for your life is and what God's purpose for your life is. Yeah, sinners probably are more fun people, you know. If you need drugs and alcohol and psychedelics and all of these things out there, preaching to the choir used to be that person. It's probably a lot more fun. You see, because being a follower of Jesus might look like you're in a cage at first because it doesn't make any sense. You know, you, you brought us from captivity, but we're back in bondage. When what really is happening is you're learning boundaries and you're learning how to be transformed and walk in your purpose in life within the confines and safety. This is a safety net. You see, because once you can be trusted to remain in the boundaries, see, then you can be trusted to walk out on your own and reach people and speak to people because you can be trusted to love people. So what looks like bondage at first is ultimately freedom. Because you are learning a new way of life that is protection. And what looks like so much fun and freedom at first ultimately becomes death and bondage. Because there's, there's no escape. Nobody gets out of being judged. Even believers face judgment. Every single person has to account for their life and their words. The point is, is... Is it going to matter? Nothing we do matters at all if we do not accept Jesus as our Messiah, as the living Son of God. Because you want to know what happens at judgment? I'll share it. I'll absolutely share it. You want to know what happens? The church has been teaching it wrong. God doesn't forget your sins until Judgment Day. Because at Judgment Day, you have to make an account for everything. And you have no room to say anything. Because you know. In the presence of that righteousness, of that <sighs> perfection, of that presence, you absolutely know everything that you did in your life and you cannot argue you want to know what saves you jesus steps in because he's the word of god and god is submitted to his word jesus steps in and he says but they loved me john 14 15 they loved me that is the moment that yahweh tosses your sins as far as the east is to the west that's the moment that he forgets. That's the moment that you walk into heaven. You see, but if that moment doesn't happen, Yahweh doesn't toss your sins as far as the east is to the west. He spits you out of the mouth from the courtroom of judgment. And hell ends up with your file. And you are tortured and tormented by your works and your words. You can call me crazy all day long. But I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Not gonna. That is why Matthew chapter 7 says the way is narrow. Few find it. Angels do not throw a party for you until you walk into heaven. Because 
That's when salvation happens. That's why our walk on this earth is patient endurance and those who endure to the end will be saved. Not the minute you start believing. No, that's when your walk starts. <laughs> that's when your transformation begins. It's a walk. It's a process on purpose. We're giving the tools. The church is just too concerned with making people feel good about themselves to actually want anybody to be able to be made holy for he is holy. See, I'm struggling with the word of all books of the Bible, really with everything I've ever known. Yeah, Lando, I feel it. I understand it. It is hard to get back down to the foundation because we have, as scripture tells us, inherited the lies of our fathers. Because they inherited lies, who inherited lies, who inherited lies, who inherited lies. And it's just man-made doctrines and traditions passed around. I can't tell you the amount of times my head has spinned and I have literally felt like my brain was going to explode because I knew the church was wrong on a lot of things, but I didn't know what the truth was. So I prayed a dangerous prayer. You can ask yeah, Amazing Grace 2020, I'm the CEO of Praying Dangerous Prayers. I don't know if it's boldness or stupidity at this point. Um, but I asked, I asked the Father to allow the Holy Spirit to line my theology and my understanding and my doctrine up with the theology and doctrine of the Father. Because I had come to this realization after being put in hell. This was back right before Thanksgiving. I had come to the realization that while a lot of wisdom and understanding I had been given, there was still too much that were lies. And I knew in that moment that if the words that I spoke did not line up with the Father and did not line up with the understanding of heaven, then nothing I said and did mattered. And all I was doing was lying to people and giving false hope. There is nothing more cruel than to give a person false hope because you don't want to hurt someone's feelings. Look, there's a way to share the truth. And it's a choice to be offended. The thing is, is I'm not speaking to offend somebody right now. I'm speaking the truth. I'm speaking it because I desire nothing more than God's will, which is that no one should perish. I don't want anybody to experience that. At all. Ever. I never want to experience that again. So everything that I'm saying is coming from a, tr a genuine place of I love you and I care about your soul more than I care about what makes you feel good. So please know that I'm never speaking to intentionally offend anybody. So if you become offended, that is between you, your emotions or you and God, whatever you believe in. My page is welcome to everybody. So please know. And if you want to be that person, God's Romans 2.11. God is not a respecter of anyone. He doesn't believe in nepotism. He doesn't play favorites. He honors the obedient. He honors the faithful. Get on your face before the Lord and pray some dangerous prayers. Ask him to break your heart for what breaks his. Ask him to give you wisdom and understanding. Ask him to open the word up to you in a way that just finally makes it all make sense. Ask him to line your theology up with his. Pray some dangerous prayers. He honors those who seek after him. Hebrews eleven six. And if you're a non-believer, you're adamantly a non-believer. Perfect. Test, test him at his word. Pray a dangerous prayer. Start with asking him to break your heart for what breaks his. You know what? Ask him to show up in the room with you. Ask him to make himself real to you. Don't tell anybody that you prayed this prayer. Don't tell anybody you prayed it. So that way nobody can make it 
out that they did it or whatever, but just with yourself out loud, fully believe it. It's called the fleece of Gideon. Ask God to show himself true to you in a way that only he can prove that he is God. And what I mean by that is ask him to give you a dream of something specific. Ask him to play a song with a specific meaning. If there's somebody who was in your family who has passed away and you haven't seen their number on your phone in a long time and that number got gave, given to somebody else, pray that that number calls you because that person who has their new number dialed a wrong number. And put your faith behind it. Just, just, just a little bit of faith behind it. Because God wants you to know that he's real. He wants you to know that he's true. I can't prove it to you and nobody else can. Only he can. No, made worthy, you're not supposed to tempt God. God tells us in Micah to test him at his word. Because that produces trust in the relationship with him. Tempting means do not put yourself in a position where he has to show up just because you're trying to show off or trying to prove some kind of a point. Like when Satan was telling Jesus to jump off a tall building because God has to show up and save him. That's, that's tempting God. There's a difference between tempting and testing. Like the sex of the Christian church people who drink poison and try to handle poisonous snakes to try to prove that John chapter 14 where Jesus is talking about those who really believe in him is real. That's tempting God. Testing God is saying, hey, Lord, you said that you reward those who diligently seek you. Let me test it. Let me diligently seek you and prove that you are true. There's a difference between testing and tempting. Hmm. Intelligence isn't a gift of the Holy Spirit. Knowledge of heaven is. Wisdom of heaven is. Intelligence is something you're born with. The Holy Spirit didn't peak. We are supposed to intercede. We just read pray without ceasing. Holy Spirit does intercede for us. It's a heavenly language. Ephesians chapter 6, 10 through 20, it even says praying at all times in the spirit that the spirit may be interceding for you. That's not in your Bible. You read a Bible that's been changed. Work on that. Yeah, my clock is loud at night for some reason. I don't understand it. So we get into 2 Thessalonians, and I'm going to try and speed through this because I did not intend to be on here for two hours, and I apologize. So 2 Thessalonians, we immediately begin in chapter 1 that Paul knew about John's revelations of the book of Revelation because he immediately starts describing the church of Thessalonica the way that the church of Smyrna is discussed in the letters to the seven churches. Tongues is a spiritual prayer language with the Holy Spirit interceding for you. Now, it happens in two separate ways. One, you can pray in tongues. It is a heavenly prayer language, but you can also prophesy in tongues. So that's when scripture is saying speak in tongues, it is talk about prophesying in tongues. At, on the back half of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul makes that distinction. and He says, now I would that you all pray in tongues. I pray in tongues. In fact, I do it more than you. But you should all desire all of, you know, these other gifts to know. But speaking in tongues is prophesying in tongues. And then there's praying in tongues. Those are two separate gifts. And when you speak or prophesy in tongues, that is the gift that requires the interpreter. But if you hear somebody praying in tongues, it doesn't require an interpreter. Why? Because that conversation is not your business. Now, if God gives you the ability to interpret what's being prayed, that's between you and God. There is a difference in praying and prophesying in tongues. It is in scripture. Stop relying on what your pastors told you. Get a Strong's Concordance 
and study. St study. I'm desperate for prayer. I've been failing so much. Don't feel worthy to worship or pray. Other things going on. I'm going to take a minute right here. Right now, in the name of Jesus Christ, I come against the spirit of failure. I come against the spirit of desperation. I come against a spirit of anxiety. I come against a spirit of guilt and shame and a spirit of unworthiness. These things are not of you, Father. These things are not in your plan or your purpose for any of your children. For your word says that you give us peace and you give us understanding and you give us love and you give us wisdom and you call us worthy because of your son's sacrifice and our belief and our trust in that, Lord. And thank you right now for this person's life. I thank you right now that you have a purpose and a call for her, that she will live and not die, that she will succeed and not fail, that anything that ever tells her that she is not good enough, that by Isaiah 54, 17, she will cast those words that are occurring to her down for they do not line up with your word because proverbs 18 21 lord your word which you have submitted yourself to we will speak life so that life will continue to grow and become abundant in her that whatever she touches her hands to whatever her words are spoken over will breed life will breed purpose will breed love will show the truth of your light in her life these spirits of anxiety and of failure and of unworthiness are not of you, Father, and they do not belong in the hearts of your children. I speak to these spirits right now in 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 an N M G lover. Go now in the name of Jesus. These spirits do not belong to you. Let them go. In the name of Jesus, Amen. I don't typically do that. Um, Thank you, Lord. So, anyways. So this is where we learn that Paul does know about these revelations that happened with John when he was um, exiled on the island of Patmos where he got the visions for the book of Revelation. Paul knows about them. He's writing to Thessalonica as if they are the church of Smyrna. And so we're learning that they're he is making distinctions that they are righteous and it is considered a righteous gift of the father to be martyred and persecuted and go through trials for his name psalm 105 15 touch not my anointed do my prophets no harm god takes <laughs> says it is a righteous thing with god to rep recompense or take vengeance on those who harm his children vengeance belongs to god and there is where he goes, verse 8, taking vengeance on them, both, takes vengeance on those that don't know God and those that know God, but do not obey the words that Jesus spoke, which was all of God's commands because he is the word made flesh. Hear me, believers. God will place you in wrath for disobedience. You need to learn your Bible, not what your pastor says. Please, 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 please. I'm not speaking out of my butt here, straight from scripture. Those people, both, those that don't know God, have rejected him, have blasphemed him, those who know God but have remained disobedient and lawless and in sin and abusing his grace shall be punished with an everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. And this is where I am going to, yet again, mess with your theology. That verse isn't talking about hell. Mm -mm. That verse is talking about New heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem. After the millennial reign, after the lake of fire has taken place, after the second judgment. Yep, there's two judgments. Read Revelation chapter 22. Again, people aren't going far enough in their Bibles. So, here's how we know it's not talking about hell. Because those who are separated from his presence and his glory 
will admire those who are labeled as saints, those who are labeled as righteous. Those who were punished admire all them that truly believed and acted in that belief. There is the difference between saved and sanctified. If you are saved, congratulations, you made it to new earth. You can only exist on new earth. You will not be allowed to enter new Jerusalem. You will not be allowed to enter into new heaven. And you cannot, remit, you cannot enter into the presence of the Father. But you get to live on new earth. That is the difference between saved and sanctified. Are you cool with just being saved now? Is salvation enough for you? I'm just saying. If it is, it is. Awesome. This will also be in my book coming out in the fall. The Believer's Birthright. So. Chapter 11. <laughs> that all will fulfill God's goodness in the work. The work of faith. That work is obedience and trust. Hear me again. Stop reading Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 and forgetting to read verse 10. We are saved by grace through faith. Not of our works, lest any man should boast, but we are the workmanship of God and have been ordained to walk in the works that he has created for us. So it's not our works that saves us. It's Christ's sacrifice, faith and grace, but we must walk in the work that has been ordained and purpose for us, which means after we believe there's work to be done. Obedience. Please get it through your hyper grace, thick skulls, believers, not unbelievers. Believers, I have to be firm with you right now. If you were absolutely out here telling people it is a hyper grace situation and it's not about works at all, yet you intentionally left out a passage of scripture to fit your narrative, you are considered the evil servant the bad watchman repent scripture disagrees with you when you read it in context 12 the name of our lord jesus christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our god and the Lord Jesus Christ, through the Ruach, which is the Holy Spirit, according to the grace. Why is this important? Daniel chapter 9, verses 4 and verse 18. The prayer is that God shows grace and mercy abundantly to those who walk in obedience according to his word. Not perfection. Obedience is not perfection. Obedience is a process. It means that you're doing it even if you're struggling. That's okay. Just do it. It doesn't matter that you start. doesn't matter when. doesn't matter how. It matters that you do. It's not about perfection. None of us are perfect except Christ. But the reason we are allowed to have in Scripture end times warning and prophecies is in response to Daniel's prayer in Daniel chapter 9 Begging that the Father show grace and mercy to those who are righteous and love him and obey his commands. The 70 weeks prophecy and end times prophecy came in response to Daniel's prayer. So what is the grace of our God? Whom does it go to? Because he shows grace to whom he will show grace to and he shows mercy to whom he chooses to show mercy to exodus thirty three nineteen is because of daniel chapter 9 verses 4 and verses 18 and i am harping on this because it doesn't matter how many times i talk about it and yes some people who are tort observant got it wrong because they were leaving one half truth for another Combine them. Just combine them. And I'm sorry my neck twitched right then. Had a neck pop. So, I'm going to harp on it. 
because it's important. It's important enough that it is literally mentioned in just about every single book of the Bible. Which means if scripture disagrees with you, get off your high horse and figure out why. Now this is where we're going to start talking about the coming of the Antichrist. I'm trying to speed through this. I apologize. <laughs> Chapter 2, verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means. Any means. Revelation chapter 13, verses 14. Revelation chapter 18, verses 23. I'm going to break your heart again. You don't have a choice in the matter concerning the mark. Um, you have a choice on whether you will be deceived or not. You have a choice whether you will be alive and awake in Christ and awake spiritually in the fire burning on the altar of your heart, or you have a choice to be spiritually dead and spiritually asleep. That's where deception can take place. So your choice is, are you going to be deceived? Because scripture is clearly saying, don't let yourself be deceived. Because Revelation 13, 14 and Revelation 18, 23 are synonymous and it says, by all deceivableness and sorceries, everyone young and old, poor and rich, sick and healthy, was forced. Why? Because they cried, peace and safety. Then destruction. Deception is your choice. What the Antichrist does, not your choice. You're not God. <laughs> Hope you're not Satan. All right. So the day of the Lord, which is the second coming, second coming, rapture, all of these things, won't happen until, which means it's after, which means if you're preaching pre-trib doctrine, you're leading people to the Antichrist. I will continue to say this every single week till everybody wakes up. After the great falling away, the apostasia, and so at the same time, and that man of sin, lawlessness, sin is transgressing of the law, that man of sin be revealed. Okay, here's how you know he is the Antichrist and he is revealed. He will have already been on the scene for three and a half years. At that three and a half year mark is when he is killed. And three and a half days later, he rises from the dead. Why? Because he's trying to convince people that he's the real Messiah. This is why it's important also that you understand the law and command of God and God's rules. Because he says that anybody who says do not follow his law is a false prophet. The man of lawlessness will tell you. That we no longer have to follow the law of God. Again, people preaching against God's commands is leading you to the Antichrist. You're being deceived by the very church you're claiming to love. Come out of her, my people. The, ma the man of sin, man of lawlessness, be revealed. Which means he has now risen with all power. He is officially the Antichrist working with the power of Satan. The son of perdition. What is perdition? Perdition means to destroy utterly. John 10.10. 10, the thief, Satan, comes to still, kill, and destroy. Which means the Antichrist is the son of Satan. And I don't mean that by literal means that he is blood to Satan. I mean that... Whomever you act like, whomever you emulate is who your parent is in the spirit. So you're either a child of God or by default, you are a child of Satan. There's no in between. You cannot serve two masters. So this is what it means by being the son of perdition. His power comes from Satan. This is literal. This is scripture. I'm reading it word for word. It is time that we get rid of the lies that we inherited from our fathers. And I mean our church fathers. So, Christ, sorry, not Christ, I apologize. Verse 4, 
who, the man of sin, the Antichrist, opposes everything that is of God, exalts himself over everything that is of God, the Christian God, Yahweh, but also exalts himself over every single false god. So all of you out there who are practicing Norse mythology, Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, um, any and all kinds of witchcraft, yeah, he's going to call himself greater than those gods too. He exalts himself over everything because he's searching for that same power with the same arrogance that Satan had that got, kicks, that got Satan kicked out of heaven. To understand the end, you have to understand the beginning. Isaiah 46.10 He told the end from the beginning. It's full circle. So, verse 7. The mystery of iniquity is the spirit of the Antichrist. It's already here. We know it's already here because 1 John chapter 4 tells us it is already in the earth. Anything that is in opposition to Christ and in opposition to Yahweh, in opposition to the Holy Spirit, is the spirit of the Antichrist. Because it is a spirit. It is an attitude. Then, then and only then, after all of these things have taken place, that is when Christ comes back. Then and only then. At the end of tribulation, rapture. Three years of wrath. At the end of wrath, then he's the second coming and the coming of his light. Verse 8, the coming of his light will destroy the Antichrist and the false prophet. Cast them into the lake of fire. You guys are showing up late. I will be posting this live on my YouTube. I'm talking about my series of Unraveled that we've been talking about the last two days. We've done First and Second Thessalonians. I'm in the second half of chapter two of Second Thessalonians. There's only three chapters in it. If you are late, that is okay. Subscribe to my YouTube. You will get a notification. I have been posting the lives from every week up there as well. I don't got time for this. Uh, mute down, Winder. I I'm not going to play these games. If y'all want to show up and be disrespectful to me, cool. But you're not going to show up and be, be disrespectful to the, to the Savior. No. All right. But I want you guys to pay attention here. So the when Christ's return onto the earth after the rapture is known as the second coming. His first coming was when he was born. This is the second coming. Chapter 8 and chapter 9. The light of his second coming will destroy the Antichrist and the false prophet. Chapter 10. And his light will also destroy those who receive not the love of truth that might be saved. Now, what that means? It means people who were believers in Jesus but enjoyed lawlessness, enjoyed hypergrace, enjoyed living in sin. But it's okay because I believe in Jesus. According to this, you're not as safe as you thought. Not be time to read your Bible. And you know why? Because chapter verse 11 says, God sends a strong delusion because of the believer's lawlessness, God sends a strong delusion that they would believe the lie. It's called a lying spirit. Why is this important? Because in 1 Kings chapter 22, verses 1 through 28, God sent a lying spirit to convince Ahab to go into battle so that he would be killed. Why? Because God cursed Ahab. Sorry. Let me rephrase. Ahab put a curse on himself when he went against the covenant that God made with him. And God has to be true to his word, which means that curse is sent forth. And Ahab died the same way that the four or five kings before him also died 
for destroying and going against the covenant that God made with them. From the end, sorry, from the beginning, he told the end. This isn't a new thing. He's done it before. Romans 1, 26 through 30. What's the reprobate mind? God sends a strong delusion that they might believe the lie. Because they love lawlessness and abusing his grace. This is scripture. So if you call yourself a Christian, get in the word. And if you don't call yourself a Christian, I appreciate you joining. Even if you're mocking, even if you're making fun, a seed's being planted somewhere. Verse 13, those who stand firm in the truth give thanks always to God. Because God has chosen you after your belief. This is where I need you to understand the difference between just being saved and being sanctified. Because it says, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 13b. Salvation through sanctification of the Holy Spirit and belief of the truth. Who is the truth? Yeshua. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man come to the Father except by him. So, grace through faith is actually sanctification of the Holy Spirit by your belief in the truth starting to sound like more of a process now because it's being explained in context not because it makes you feel good i didn't when i was studying this i didn't say amen i said ouch it's a hard pill to swallow as a christian it's a hard pill to swallow to come to the understanding that everything you thought you believed in has pretty much been a lie because you have people who have inherited lies who have inherited lies, who have inherited lies, who have inherited lies. And then you've got people calling themselves to the pulpit. So they're busy just trying to give you feel-good sermons that make you feel excited about yourself so you'll keep putting money in the offering plate because they're also abusing the tithe. You see, you find the churches that abuse the tithe, which was designed by God, is a part of his law. Those who abuse the tithe are also those who called themselves to the pulpit. Pay attention. That's why it's the love of money is the root of all evil. Not money. Whereunto, after your sanctification, God calls you by the gospel, obtaining to the glory of Jesus Christ. So stand fast, Ephesians 6, and hold the traditions which ye have been taught by the word. Not by your pastors, not by your parents, by, your, by the word. Churches aren't really telling the true gospel or how to be saved. That's exactly what I'm saying. That is exactly what I'm saying. You know why I'm saying that confidently? Because I was taught to spew that same message when I was being mentored. I will confidently tell you, Mary's right, many are not. But the majority, the majority who have the ear of the people are not telling you the truth about salvation, are not telling you the truth about following Christ because they don't care about your holiness. They care about making people feel good. They care about if you're going to put money in the offering plate. Yeah, I have a donations link in my bio. And yes, I say that unintentionally trying to plug it Please don't come for me. But I don't make videos about it. I've made one and that's because my family was in desperate need of help. And I am very thankful to everybody who did donate for all of your prayers. Because they have come come to pass more than you more than you know. But even if people were not donating, I would still be teaching. I would still be getting on here every day, every week talking to you. Why? Because it's not about the money. God funds his ideas. I have it there and I have it written. If you feel led, donate, but I'm not making a huge deal about it. God will fund his ideas however he sees fit. 
be mindful of those who are constantly, and I'm not talking about those who are plugging money for donations because they legitimately need it to continue the ministry that they are doing and they are actually doing that ministry. Be mindful of those who are continually plugging, put money in the tithe, put money in donation, all these things, and they're driving Bentleys. And they're wearing Armani suits and flashing Rolexes. Be mindful of those people. The snake oil. The shirt, the shirt, this dress, sell rack at Target. <laughs> My kids have better clothes than I do. And I, I, I stopped to make that point on purpose. Churches who aren't telling you the truth are not telling you the truth because they want you to feel good. They want you to feel emotionally manipulated. So you will continue to pad their bank accounts. Because they're also abusing the tithe, which was designed to keep the temple running and to feed the hungry, shelter the homeless, clothe the naked, take care of the widow and her children, feed the hungry, all of these things. I was being mentored and trained in a church, me and my husband, and this is back when we first got married and we were struggling. I mean, like the definition of struggle bus. And see, I thought there was going to be a little bit more grace there because the pastor that I was mentoring under used to also be my youth pastor. And, you know, so there was relationship there. There was understanding. There was truth. There was authenticity. And I knew the, the truth of the tithe. There's very few things that I fully knew the truth of, but my dad made sure I knew the truth of the tithe. And we desperately went to him and his wife, being overseers of the church. I allowed him and my husband to have the conversation. And it wasn't, I visibly see you're struggling because you're driving a car that has been wrecked three times and your truck barely starts on a good day and you're pregnant. It was, we'll pray about it. You see, you no know, scripture says, if you see them in need, fill the need. You don't have to pray about it when the storehouse has been supplied. You don't have to pray about it when the storehouse has not been supplied. Pay attention. Stop abusing the tithe. There's a reason I'm writing books and doing all these outside work so there's no reliant on the abuse of anything that comes in. Be the example. It is not hard to be the example that you're, you're calling for others to be. Which is what Paul's talking about in chapter 3. At the end of it, he says, Do not keep company with anybody who is lawless, who walks disorderly. In fact, don't call them your enemy, but don't call them your brother or sister. The company you keep and will give you the trouble you meet. Birds of a feather flock together. These sayings aren't just fun little quips, they're truth. So, that's why it says to abstain from the appearance of evil. Do not keep company with people who are walking in iniquity and walking in sin. Yes, and by keep company, I mean deep fellowship with a person you would call family. Now, you can love somebody. You can minister with somebody. You can lift somebody up. You can answer a prayer. You can help them move. You can be that compassionate person. But I'm talking believer to believer here. Do not consider somebody your brother or your sister who is not walking in the same righteousness that you were walking in because your righteousness isn't going to rub off on them. Their unrighteousness is going to rub off on you. It's easier to make a clean canvas dirty than it is to make a dirty canvas clean. So, chapter 3, verse 9. Be the example because Christ is the example. Yes, four corners truth. You'll know them by their fruit. Holy means set apart. Also right. God cares more about our holiness than he cares about our happiness. That's why scripture says to be warned of those who are preaching to tickle the ears. Because... 
God wants us happy. He wants us filled with joy, but he cares first about our holiness. If we're not holy for he is holy, then nothing else matters because be ye holy for I am holy is a command and you should all have joy is optional. There's a difference. Potentially, if you're walking with the spirit, you're going to have joy that is beyond understanding. But definitely, if you're walking with the spirit, allowing yourself to be transformed, you are going to be made into a holy person. Because that's a command. Christianity does not teach us to be against God. Now, if you're talking about, well, be a little bit clearer on that. There is a form of the original doctrine of Christianity that was by St. Ignatius that was be talking about um, calling people who were these other things, mocking people who believe in Jesus. That's why the original sect off of Judaism called themselves the way or followers of the way because Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Um, so four corners truth is right. If you, I know comment section doesn't give you enough room, but try to be a little bit more specific because not everybody is in that same place of understanding as you are. And I don't want someone to get confused. Show them fearfully confident. So that's where we get to verse 10. If any would not work, neither should he eat. He's warning about being lazy. This is both physical and spiritual. You ain't working. You ain't eating. You didn't make the bread. You don't eat the bread. What is it that so many, uh, <laughs> uh, my family says it, um, when we have family reunions, get togethers, barbecues, you don't bring a dish. You don't make a plate. So, but that's also spiritual. If you're not doing the work of the father, then you are not going to be spiritually filled. You're not going to be able to meditate and eat, to chew on the word that has been spoken out to you. It's not going to make sense. It's going to begin to confuse you because you're not applying it. Everything in scripture is meant to be applied. It's one thing to have the knowledge. It's another thing to have the applied knowledge. Verse 11, please hear me. I think this is most specifically to 90% of, I'm going to say this properly. Gossiping Gina's who have their knitting and crochet groups, who wear Lululemons, walking around all day, drinking their Starbucks. I can't hang out. I'm super busy. Just because you are busy does not mean that you are working. Busy does not equal work. Busy equals distraction. It is quality over quantity. Heart posture still every time. God doesn't care how much work you're doing. He just cares that there is quality and compassion and love and truth in it. So, 2 Thessalonians 3.11. Not everybody who works is working properly because they're just busy. Verse 12. Now them that are such that we command that you exhort, that you exalt them, you lift them up, are those who quietly work and eat their own bread. There is dignity and being silent about what you are doing and let and letting other people see it and letting other people lift it up. This is why John chapter 5 verse 31 is so important. I think it's verse 30 or verse 31. Jesus says to the Pharisees, If I bear witness on myself, my witness is not true. I could sit out here and tell you all of these plans and these things and stuff that God's got me going and doing and whatnot. But then that's putting glory on myself. That's, and the glory belongs to the Father. Because he's our strength. He gives us the endurance. 
He is our joy. He is our righteousness. He deserves the glory. So it is better to quietly, in dignity, do your work, need your bread, and let somebody else notice and let somebody else say something than it is to boast yourself up because you just have to be accepted and you just have to be noticed. Preaching to the choir used to be this person that is also why I was relentlessly bullied in school because I just had to be noticed. I just had to be accepted. Granted, people didn't know what was already going on in my life elsewhere, but I was still that person. I cared what people thought about me. I cared if people thought I was good enough. And then I learned what it meant to be spiritually unbothered. I don't care anymore. This flesh, this flesh is dead. Dead people don't get embarrassed. Dead people don't care. It's my spirit that's alive in Christ. And if any man obey not the word, the law, the commands of God, note that person. Now notice here it says note, make a note of, mental note. It does not say call out. It does not say shout from the rooftops. It does not say to embarrass publicly. It says note it and then have no company with them. Don't call him your enemy because we have one enemy. That is Satan. We fight not with flesh and blood, but with principalities, powers, and spiritual wickedness seated in high places. That person's not your enemy. But he is also not your brother. She is also not your sister. There is a mutual respect that we both are alive. We both deserve love. We both deserve compassion. We both deserve grace and forgiveness. What, what was it to um, bring Tupac into church? We can be civil. I still want you to eat. You're just not going to eat at my table. Scripture. So. We've now broke down Thessalonians. And I am hoping, with all that is within me, that I have finally got the point across that pre-trib is not a thing. Pre-trib is false. Pre-trib is leading people to the Antichrist. The Torah, the law of God, being done away with, nailed to the cross. Not a thing. That doctrine is leading people to the Antichrist. Hell is real. There's a difference between saved and being sanctified. There is a difference between being sanctified and actually walking with the Holy Spirit. That's what I like to call the sweet spot. And Jesus lived in the sweet spot. Bible, do I recommend it's easier to understand? Okay, so I started. God is absolutely not dead, but I appreciate you sharing your ignorance with the world. Um, the Bible that I recommend, I use a Nelson's, it is a Nelson's teacher's study Bible. It is marked all the way up. This was, I got this one five years ago. Um, it was a, um, engagement present present from my mom. Um, so it's got a lot of, it's got a strongest concordance and all that stuff within it. Um, I started reading a, um, I think it's a dual, it's called like a dual Bible, so on one, on one page, you have one column is King James, and you have another column that's like Amplified, NIV, ESV, any of those versions. Um, I started with a, a um, split scripture like that because I wanted to know how to read King James because King James is the closest when it comes to word for word, and I'm a person that I have to look up the linguistics and follow the... Um, the syntax and the sentence structure, like that's just how my brain works. Um, so I needed that word for word. Now my next thing to get is a Septuagint because it is the absolute closest. Um, but right now I enjoy the King James, but to be able to understand it, I'm going to say get one of those um, divided Bibles that show King James on 
one column and then like an amplified ESV or NIV on another. So that way you can learn how to read it. But then you're also, thank you, a parallel Bible. Thank you, Puritan 75. Yes, it's a, 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 a parallel Bible. And that's going to help you learn how to understand the King James Bible. Because I, I understand fully that not everybody can read and understand Old English. Do you condone beating a servant to near death? No, I don't. I don't condone beating a servant to near death. And actually, neither does Scripture. The Torah... Or the law of God, the stuff that set out, which I know is where this question came from, actually has a guideline system set in with it. And for a stoning to take place with a bad servant or a adult child, not an actual child, an adult child, those situations to happen, there had to be two witnesses. Those two witnesses had to give an account to a council of elders, like a court system, then those council of elders would look at the life of that individual and come to a vote. Now, this is also understood in Jewish history and Jewish oral tradition of law. They were actually considered bloodthirsty if they killed more than two people in seven years if more than two people were brought to the death penalty in seven years that was considered bloodthirsty just because there is guideline for it does not mean that it is an everyday application but that is the same thing when you are calling out people who are false prophets and false teachers there must be two witnesses a council of those who are righteous come to an agreement, look at their life if you can. Then, because it's about heart posture, if you're able to, speak to that person directly, following scripture. Then if you can't speak to that person directly or they don't hear you, you bring a, bring a friend with you. And then if they still don't hear you, then you bring their parents with you and then if they still don't hear you you bring the congregation with you so now you're just keeping it still in the church and then if they still don't hear you that is when you turn them over to a court of public opinion there is scripture guidelines for these things just because it's in there doesn't mean it's an everyday occurrence don't let yourself get lost in your lack of understanding of the character just because something taken out of context, seems cruel. God didn't support it either. There's actually guidelines and stuff in there that every seven years, somebody who is a servant and in that same time frame, because God doesn't condone slavery and the beating down of another group of people, servitude was indentured servitude or a way of stifling a rebellion and it never had anything to do with race. It always had something to do with fear. There was always multiple groups of people held down in servitude, but there was also the law of Jubilee, which is every seven years, every single debt is forgiven, every servant and or slave is set free. But likewise also, if that servant chooses to stay, for whatever reason, it's the servant's choice. It's not a force. That is why there is an, there needs to be a deeper understanding of the wholeness of God's character, the wholeness of the truth, because we're out here teaching a bunch of different half-truths and not reading what's in context, and that is where people are getting angry. That's where it's easy to see a God who Christians claim is love. It's easy to see him as somebody who's cruel because we haven't gotten into the depth of what is actually being said. And it's not entirely your fault because the people you're supposed to be trusting to lead you and teach you aren't. It's hard to learn something that you don't know how to learn. Yeah, he hated religion and legalism. And actually his exact words were, the Pharisees are hypocrites and are whitewashed tombs. Why? Why? Because they honored him with, his, with their lips, 
the words that they spoke, but they weren't doing what they were saying to do. That's why Jesus told everybody, listen to what they say do. Do what they say do, but don't do what they do. Because they care about self-righteousness. They care about the appearance of holiness instead of being holy. They cared more about enforcing their man-made traditions, especially if their man-made tradition was able to be exalted over one of the commands in the law of God. That's what Jesus was preaching against. Because doing that adds to the word of God and takes away from the word of God, which Revelations 22, 18 and 19 is very, very clear. Don't do it. Jesus was preaching against the opposition to the Torah because of self-righteousness and hypocrisy. It wasn't the law of God. It was the law of man. Because the law of God said, be baptized, which means yourself be cleansed. Law of man, the Pharisees and Sadducees, said, you must baptize your hands every single time before you even eat something. Because even if you eat something clean, you've now made it dirty because you put your hands in the dirt. They were making it impossible to live and feel like you were able to get close to the Father. Because of self-righteousness and hypocrisy. It wasn't about the law of God. It was about the law of man. That's why Jesus flipped tables. Also, because they were defiling the temple by abusing the tithe and turn, turning it into a buyer and seller's farmer's market. How many churches do we see today who have turned part of their church, their temple, into a farmer's market? Get books here. Buy coffee here. Got some t-shirts. Got your t-shirts. Have a website for that. Not in the temple. If you're going to have that in the temple, it better be free. And it better be offered with a smile and with love for that person. I actively refuse to go to churches who have gift shops. I will be explaining the seven churches in Re of Revelation this coming week of Unraveled. We are beginning Revelation, and that is actually going to be on next week's live. And that is your opinion, Alex. Can't make a change for you. If you want God to prove to you he's real, you need to take that up with God. Not me. But anyways, it is now 15 till midnight. I was on here late, so I decided to stay on late. Thank you guys for joining me. I will be getting this up on YouTube as soon as possible. I'm so behind in posting my videos and I apologize and I appreciate your patience. Um, so link in my bio, like and subscribe. So if you're late, show up late or have to leave in the middle of any of my lives ever, you will be able to find them reposted um, on my YouTube channel. Um, if you haven't got my book yet and you've been wanting to, haven't been able to find it, or because I talked about it tonight, you're now interested. Also, link in my bio. It is the first blue square. I am going to say this, and I'm saying this because this is not a money grab. I don't want this to come off as a money grab. And it, <sighs> But I am running a ministry. I appreciate your righteous prayers a whole lot more. They go further. They are pleasing to God more. If you feel led. If you feel led just because I have not been able to get everything else that I'm in the process of getting done, done yet because of financial blockage. And I can reveal that that is starting a publishing company. <laughs> That's been fun. Um, but if you feel led to donate, that link is also in my bio. If you need to contact me, my messages are public here on TikTok and on Instagram. If you feel like you need more space to contact me, there is a button to contact me on the link in my bio. Um, have, I like to tell Brandy this all the time. Heaven doesn't have office hours. So please feel free to message me at any point, at any time. I'll get back to it as soon as I can, but I will never, I'll never post a time slot where you can only message or get a hold of me at 
any point in time. If you need to message me, whether by email, by TikTok, by Instagram, all of my messages are public. Please do so. Heaven doesn't have office hours. That means I don't have office hours. I love you all so much. Thank you for joining me. I will see you next week when we are now finally talking about revelations. Bye.